Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Sly Can Trust. Uh, today, we are going to talk and have an interview with uh, Dr. B. V. R. Punyavardhana uh, on the topic of food security and disaster and climate risk management. Uh, Dr. B. V. R. Punyavardhana is the director as well as the principal scientist uh, in agroclimatology at the Natural Resource Management Center at the Department of Agriculture, Pera Denia. Uh, we will begin our interview right about now. Thank you, Dr. Punya Bardana, for taking time um, of your very busy schedule. Uh, we really appreciate you coming uh, on board on this web-based interview. Uh, that uh, seems to be the new norm uh, with what is happening in the world around us. Um, I'll, start, uh, I'll straight away start with the questions. Um, Dr. Punya Bardana, would you say that Sri Lanka's agriculture sector is vulnerable to climate and disaster risks? Yes. In a nutshell, it is yes. Not only yes, we are very, very vulnerable uh, from two aspects. One is due to the uh, high variability of seasonal rainfall. That means we are not getting the correct amount of rainfall at the correct time. And whereas we will get more rainfall when it is not needed. That means more droughts, more floods. Both are equally affecting the Sri Lankan agriculture sector. In terms of the other aspect of the climate change, that is we are experiencing the increase in trend of ambient temperature, air temperature. So our temperature, Sri Lankan temperature is uh, slowly, but very consistently increasing at a rate of 0 0.01 degrees to 0 0.03 degrees per year. That means per decade, it will be 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. And in 100 years, so it will be 1 to uh, 3 degrees. That's exactly within the IPCC projections about uh, uh, to 2 degrees. So that means, the climate change is not a myth in Sri Lanka, it is a reality and it has a significant bearing on the Sri Lankan agriculture. Uh, uh, Dr. Purnivaldana, would you be able to give us some examples as well so that uh, you know anyone who's listening in could uh, link example, this with uh, okay. what is happening in reality? So, I, I will take a very, very uh, maiden example. The Maha season uh, of the Sri Lankan agriculture uh, should start normally October 1st week in the special dry and intermediate, intermediate zone where the agriculture is the mainstay of the economy and the livelihood of the uh, peasant sector. So, but this year still now we are at third week of the uh, second week of the end of the second week of this uh, October, but it's still no rains in the dry and intermediate zone. Farmers are really desperate for rains. So normally Maha rains comes on time, but here you will see that this year no rains. And this was the it was the same story in 2017, and it was the same story in 2012. It was the same story in 2011 and 2004, 2002. Times uh, and these are the sequences. So Maha season is going to be pale uh, this time, for, and pale not pale means not entirely, but there will be repercussions of the delay in uh, second intermonsoon rains. Uh, which should start in first week of October. And the Med Department has forecasted that until 25th of October, there will be rain in the dry and intermediate zone. But then it is a serious issue. As, as when we have these sort of climate and disaster risks uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, how is it uh, addressed in the Sri Lanka's food sector? And how are we going to address it? <clears throat> For example, now we are actually almost 99% almost self-sufficient in our staple rice. And we are importing only around 200,000 uh, metric tons uh, of uh, basmati, which we can grow in Sri Lanka under the prevailing climatic conditions. So it is a must for especially the uh, uh, hospitality sector, tourist uh, hotels and all that. Uh, unless otherwise, we are self sufficient in our stable price. And now, for example, if this time, Maha season going to be delayed, some of the uh, irrigation schemes may have to uh, stop the uh, cultivation. For example, if <coughs> we cannot grow after the November 15th, then if you, <coughs> sorry, if you grow but after November 15th, there might be a repercussion in the uh, next yellow season. Are, uh, the harvesting is going to be caught into the uh, late March rains. So in that case, Normally, Maha season, we are going to, uh, normally we uh, cultivate three and a half months or four month varieties, which are definitely giving high yields. So if the season delayed this year, so we, we have no option other than coming back to the three months varieties. 
so that means with the, uh, I mean, we have to compromise some yields. Compromise yields after with going three months varieties means so it affects the national uh, rice production. So that means there will be some uh, rice uh, deficiencies. That means we may have to import, even though right now we are self subsidized So likewise, uh, it has a serious implications in the uh, food security. If you take the other uh, food crop sector, uh, for example, big onion, normally we cultivate big onion in uh, yellow season. It's uh, somewhere around uh, April to June. So sometimes this normally this uh, during this time uh, there are no uh, appreciable amount of rain in the dry zone, so then the crop can grow with the supplementary irrigation. But during last several years, continuously there were, there were some rains, unexpected rains in May, and these destroyed all these uh, big Ghanaian crops. Now, for example, the big Ghanaian farmers are now not willing to grow uh, big Ghanaian because this. Uh, unexpected rains devastate their crops because you know that one kg of uh, big onion seed is 15,000. Uh, 15, so in a one rain it can destroy entirely. So therefore they are now weaning away from the big onion cultivation. So, but we need at least uh, around uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, I think we need uh, 15,000 uh, 15, metric tons per month. And so that means we are going to expend huge amount of foreign exchange in importing uh, big onions from uh, neighboring countries. But we were at one time when the climate was so, uh, and, uh, climate was acting like a good child. So the farmers were uh, cultivating big onion in vast extents. And we were able to at least uh, to fulfill considerable amount of uh, uh, our requirement. But now I think almost 10, uh, we are now almost 90% big onion we are importing. But at one time it was not the situation because of the climate change, the unexpected rains, farmers are weaning away from the uh, big onion cultivation. Similarly with other crops. And right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Punya uh, So since we spoke okay. about this, um, uh, the Yala and the Maha, as well as different parts of uh, Sri Lanka that are affected by this, which parts of Sri Lanka would you identify as the most climate and disaster vulnerable areas and in your opinion what are the key reasons for this vulnerability uh reasons vulnerable if you take the vulnerable areas uh, especially the dry zone district especially the northern province uh, except Jaffna and uh, Mulatiu, Kilnachi, uh, Vaunia, Putlam, Kurnagala, uh, Hambantuta, Monragala uh, Batik Pro Ampar, almost all entire uh, dry zone and the intermediate zone districts like Urnagala and Muragala. Uh, with respect to the uh, less rainfall, and if we think about the other side of the coin, that is the excess rainfall, climate change is both sides. It's not only the drought, it's flood as well. So then it becomes uh, Kalutara, Matara, Gol, Gampaha, uh, Ratnapura, those are the districts highly vulnerable to floods. And both drought and floods equally affect the agriculture, especially the flood affects the uh, rice production. And the reason, your second question, what are the reasons for high vulnerabilities? One is the uh, our Sri Lankan agriculture is, uh, uh, especially the other field crop cultivation, non rice crop cultivation like uh, the big uh, green gram, uh, maize, cowpea, uh, black gram. Uh, even uh, big onion, these are uh, upland crops cultivated with the rain. So when there are no rains, as I said at the very outset, when it is, uh, if, the, if there are no rains when it is needed, and that means it is drought, so these crops are going to be highly affected. So if I recap it, most of our agricultural activities are rain pit, and there are no assured irrigation except for rice. So they are highly vulnerable for uh, climate change being created. Other one is the, uh, especially the, our uh, agriculture is not get modernized, uh, get to an extent what we need, like uh, uh, other countries, like uh, uh, protected agriculture. Like if you if can grow uh, crops in a shelter, like in other countries, so then it is uh, protected from the uh, vagaries of weather. So, but for farmers, uh, it is uh, beyond their uh, reality because they are lack of uh, capital. 
So because of the lack of capital uh, or working capital, they cannot invest more on uh, climate resilient agriculture. That is one reason. Lack of capital deprives them from climate resilient agriculture, like protected agriculture uh, and all, uh, other things. If we are having a water shortage problem in a uh, drought situation, so if we can switch for uh, micro irrigation like drip and sprinkler, so then we can save the water and we can increase the yield dive sale. But they need to start cap starting capital. Uh, but okay. they are, as I said, they are subsistence level farmers. They are lack of cap enough capital. So these two things are actually the major drivers of the uh, chain, uh, impact of climate change in Sri Lanka. That means being rain paid and lack of uh, enough uh, capital for farmers to invest for a climate resilient agriculture. So, uh, so are we looking at uh, regenerative agricultural systems in Sri Lanka? Do we have, um, uh, do we have, is it common in Sri Lanka, if that is the case, and resilient? Obviously, from what you said, it's not really quite what is happening. Uh, some places, there are some agricultural areas, they are actually climate resilient uh, because uh, they have, as I said earlier, they are somewhat affluent farmers especially it's not the uh, subsistence level farmers there are some entrepreneur type agriculturists in this country some those are uh, working on horticulture especially the fruits and vegetables for example if you take the Kalpidia peninsula and uh, uh, and uh, Daphna uh, they are doing very well actually despite climate change because they are having if you take the Jaffna peninsula if you take the Kalpidia peninsula they are having underground uh, groundwater uh, uh, I know that they are exploiting it uh, that, that's a different story, but still they are having underground notice. Therefore, they can go uh, year-round cultivation like vegetables and fruits. So th in that case, they are less uh, vulnerable to climate change than other areas because of the having uh, supplementary irrigation uh, sources underneath the uh, soil surface, that is the uh, ground load. And there are some areas like um, even in the um, drier part, uh, say uh, Hambantota, and some farmers are doing well with the fruit crops like banana with supplementary irrigation. They can afford these changes of climate change. Uh, most badly hit farming community is the farmers who grow uh, non-rice crop, especially the pulses and maize, uh, uh, like uh, groundnut, uh, uh, sorry, uh, green gram, cowpea, and also even sesame and black gram those are the farmers those who are badly hit by the climate change also the rice farmers those who are uh, depending on rain pit rice cultivation like in kurnagal district uh, like in the wet zone they are the badly hit uh, farm rice farmers in the country in the climate change. Um, so you would say that there are some success stories in uh, terms of resilient and re regenerative agriculture in sri lanka but yeah. how are we to scale up what are the challenges that are uh, that's kind of stopping us from getting there because yeah, we can the, get there the expertise best, is there yeah best intervention is uh, to look for climate smart agriculture csa interventions climate smart agriculture uh, it is not a one single technology it's a, a set of technologies uh, should apply uh, simultaneously like uh, providing uh, supplementary irrigation through micro irrigations and uh, providing uh, apply of uh, organic manure to increase the uh, water holding capacity and nutrient availability and apply i mean the ipm comes concept integrated uh, integrated pest management concept and uh, uh, then other thing is uh, uh, soil and water conservation in their farming fields uh, like us there are a whole set of uh, uh, climate smart, smart agriculture interventions so if we can uh, gradually uh, enter into this climate smart agriculture uh, concept, uh, especially in the rain bed uh, upland cultivations, uh, we can uh, build up some kind of resilience. And in that case, I would suggest uh, annual crops are more vulnerable. And therefore we can switch for perennial crops. So perennial crops is mostly the fruits like banana, uh, guava, uh, tapo. Uh, there are a lot of uh, fruit, uh, passion fruit and pineapple all of them have a very good uh, international market so therefore they if we switch for from 
for annual agriculture to perennial agriculture, especially for, with fruits, with uh, some uh, foreign market in hand, then we can increase the, their resilience. Uh, and then uh, how can we provide farmers with this knowledge and access to market information and so that we can sort of match the demand and supply and also prevent because there is a lot of wastage if you look at it you know yeah. certain yeah. how sure. can we now, do that uh, we, we department have a, a kind of a, a mobile app called the uh, crop uh, look so where you will uh, every fortnightly this app will be updated with the extent of the cultivation in each crop is is sensitive crop uh, rice and vegetables especially because these are the political crops so then they can decide okay now the extent of the cultivation for this season has already uh, come to the uh, end therefore therefore i should not cultivate this crop for example if the uh, uh, tomato tomato cultivation uh, extent targeted extent is two, uh, 2000 say for example so this up, uh, app is update being updated every two weeks so then farm can see how much how many hectares has been cultivated by now so if if it has come to a level of 2000 then farmer can think very logically and scientifically that if i grow tomato anymore i'll be at loss therefore he can switch for some other crop by looking at the which are the crops which, which, which we have not cultivated the full extent yet so that kind of information market information and uh, production information is there but i am not saying this app is 100 percent perfect but at least we have started it. Now, uh, farmers are gradually picking up. Uh, can we uh, just repeat that uh, the name of the app again? Uh, 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 crop look. Crop look. OK, yeah. so that's actually quite interesting. So how uh, how yeah. successful is it in terms of uh, our farmers actually on it? Do they have the technology, necessary technology? Yeah, to... This is actually um, they can have this uh, mobile app downloaded to their smartphone. But pro one problem is our farmers are not so literate. No. Yes, that's right. They might be having a smartphone, but they don't know how to <laughs> uh, <laughs> do the things. Uh, people are arguing that uh, even though farmers are not uh, mobile literate their sons and daughters can do it but yes. that's theoretically correct but in practice yes. it doesn't happen because farmer is always in the field when when he comes to the house the, the, the sons are uh, daughters are sleeping or they are with some other school work it is not the, not in reality it's not in the ground we can argue it yes and um uh, how can we address this climate risk along with the entire, you know, value and uh, supply chain? Uh, I mean, what would be the key measures to be taken to ensure that this is possible? Um, you basically to increase the resilience? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. The provision of supplementary irrigation and irrigation uh, accessories, like, uh, for example, if it is uh, sprinkler irrigation, we have to provide uh, sprinkler uh, heads and all that and uh, uh, um, tubes. and uh, uh providing some uh, concessionary loans at a low rate uh, because then they can buy some uh, high-end uh, agricultural equipment and also another uh, serious issue in sri lanka sri lanka agriculture has not mechanized yet therefore they take a very long time for uh, agricultural operations even for land preparation even from harvesting so this is a serious issue in the climate change. For example, if uh, bad weather is uh, predicted under changing climate uh, at the harvesting stage, if we are, if we can mechanize, if we can complete the harvesting time within short period, so that we can avoid the risk. But it is not happening. There are some places like in the eastern province they have this uh, 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 what's called the combined harvesters, commonly known as Bhutia and uh, tsunami. Okay. <laughs> Those are Bhutan and Sunam. That's are what they call it. They call the yeah, two types of yes, machinery. Yes. So, but it is not available everywhere. And uh, because normal farmer cannot afford it. Uh, so, what I would suggest is we have to provide the farmer federation. And then the, these farm federations should provide with this kind of agricultural uh, machineries as a site. Like, uh, so, then it's like a cooperative. So, then they can uh, hire it at a reasonable rate, at a low rate. Otherwise, if, if it is right now there's a monopoly so they charge a hell of money so therefore the government should form farmer federation through which we can have this kind of 
mechanization activities and also some kind of loan schemes, uh, low interest loan schemes and um, uh, market information. Uh, these kind of things are very important. And the most important thing in the agriculture sector in Sri Lanka and the changing and variable climate is the risk transfer. Risk transfer, that is nothing but the agriculture crop insurance scheme should be in place in order to uh, uh, reduce, uh, increase the resilience of farmers for climate change. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Punyavadana. Uh, yeah, we will be closing up in a little while, but uh, is there any other additional points that you would like to share in terms of uh, climate risk and uh, agriculture uh, and how we have yeah, to but, uh, We have already <clears throat> developed, uh, compiled a document called, <clears throat> uh, you can see this one here. You can see yes. Here. Yeah, that's right. That's the National Guideline of Climate Smart Agriculture Technologies and Practices. So there are a lot of technologies uh, we have uh, identified to increase the resilience for climate change. So one good entry point to increase the resilience of climate change, uh, to increase the resilience of agriculture sector to climate change is the <coughs> going for climate smart agriculture technologies. It's a holistic approach. It is not. A, there are a lot of things. Uh, we will uh, do simultaneously to increase the resilience. And is this uh, something that is developed within the faculty or is it like a no, national... This was, uh, this was developed by, by uh, um, uh, actually myself and Dr. Ajanta and uh, Mr. Amity uh, Goda, former, former additional secretary, Mr. Amity Goda, Dr. Ajanta, current additional secretary and myself. So that is wonderful. So we are looking forward to the changes that you are bringing and you have uh, suggested and recommended. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Punyavadana, for being here and uh, taking time of your very yeah. busy schedule because you are getting yeah. calls as you are talking. I well. for the uh, mid midway interruption from my director. Oh, no but... problem at all. We <laughs> totally understand. These are very difficult days. So this is how we uh, move forward. Thank you once again. And we all look right, forward to working up. with you uh, in the yeah. future as well. Uh, see yeah. you then and thank you. Okay, bye.